right, derivative slope, derivative slope. What is the whole idea of this derivative? So when we did the toaster flying down and we used this free fall example, this function, I mean, you'll have different functions, but for this function, I could evaluate this function at a particular value of t, okay? So for two seconds, if I plugged in two, this gives me the height of the object at that time in feet. <clears throat> what the derivative is getting, giving you, which we found the derivative function last lecture, is this gives me the rate. So notice the difference here. If I plug in two into the function, I get the value. If I plug in two into the derivative, notice the difference, that little prime, without makeup, with makeup, <laughs> uh, this is a rate. This is very important, and this is why you always have to remember your units are gonna be a rate, okay? So something per something, so in this case, feet per second. All right, there's different ways that you can write derivatives, and you know, I will say this dude here, Leibniz, I tend to like his way a little bit more. You'll see here why. So this is, you've seen this already, the f prime of x. These other ways, y prime can also be written. I don't tend to like this last way because it kind of leaves me hanging. I don't know what they're taking the derivative of. Leibniz notation, I like a lot because it's written, if you remember the delta y over delta x, this helps me with units. So this tells me the difference in y over the difference in x, which would be the y units per the x units. So I just, I tend to prefer Leibniz units. So <clears throat> let's say you're given the cost C of a stake in dollars, and it's a function of the weight W of the stake in pounds. And you wanna write this in Leibniz notation. So <clears throat> it already tells you what the function is, which will always be what's on top, right? Because that's the y value. But if you didn't know, you look for the dependent variable. The cost is going to depend on the weight. So you read this as the change in cost over the change in weight, or the change in dollars over the change in pounds. Hence, your answer would be in dollars per pound. <clears throat> Excuse me. Number n of gallons of gas left in a gas tank is a function, so I know that goes up top, of the distance d in miles the car has been driven. Again, I don't have to always tell you it's the function because the number of gallons in your car depends on how many miles you've driven. So the change in gallons over the change in miles, okay, to be able to come up with my Leibniz notation. So we had these, you know, my uh, free fall example, the, the Galileo function, 16t squared. We came up with the derivative. I could write this in Leibniz notation and even state how I evaluated it. They tend to put this straight line that's an evaluation line and then the number after it's the point you plug in. So this would say evaluate the derivative which I know is 32t for t equals two, which is the same thing down here. It's just a different way of writing it. Um, I tend to use this way. I tend to use, my brother's calling me. <laughs> I tend to use this way a lot, um, but I think most of y'all tend to like this way because you're used to evaluating functions by plugging in what's in parentheses. So either way means the same thing. So remember when we did um, our tangent line, Remember what a tangent line was? So in other words, at that exact point right there, we came up by using this whole y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1 formula, okay, to come, the point slope formula, to come up with the 32x minus 16. So we did that a while back. If I rename these things, like, so if I call y my function of t, Okay, if I call y1 my particular value that I'm interested in, which we call that a, so then my slope would be the rate at a, and then this would be the gap between the time, so between the time that I'm interested in minus the time that I know. If I chunk this to the other side, you're going to see we call this tangent line approximation. So it's the same equation here, and I like to say it in terms of what do you want, 
approximately what you know plus the rate that you know and then the error or the gap. Now the approximate is because we're assuming this gap that the rate's going to stay the same, which is crazy, but sometimes that might be all we have. So let's see an example of using this. It says use tangent line approximation to predict the height of a ball at 0.5 seconds, given the height and its rate at 0.4. So let's pretend I threw a ball up and I set and I made a table, okay? And I measured the height, you know, at these different times. And I also was given, I had the derivative. What I wanna do is use what I know, 0.4, to actually approximate what I don't know. And you might say, yeah, you know it, it's right there, but let's just say I didn't know the 0.5 seconds. So what we do, what I want, 0.5, is approximately equal to what I know, the value, or the height in this case, of the function at 0.4, the rate that it's changing, and then the gap, which is 0.5 to 0.4. And notice it's a little different, right? Because it's an approximate. In fact, if you notice, the rate is actually changing because the ball, so what's happening, this ball is going straight up very, very quickly, right? And it's starting to turn, so the slopes, the rate, are starting to change. Okay, so we say a constant function is flat and has a derivative equal to zero. Why? Because the derivative is the slope. This is just trying to get you to recognize if I said what's the derivative of this function, you'd say zero because of the slope zero. Is this derivative positive or negative? It's positive because the slope's positive. Positive or negative? Negative because the slope is negative. This is just trying to interplay, trying to get you to understand how do you actually interpret a derivative as an actual slope? All right, now this part sometimes can be weird, um, you know, to, to students that I could ask you to graph the derivative, okay, based on you have some values here. So these values, you remember when you first learned graphing, you did an X and then you did a Y and you just plugged in different values. I'm gonna give you these values. So this line, the first line is particular x values. This next line is going to be different slopes. So I'm gonna say at negative two, the slope is six. You can see it's turning, so we'll say at negative one, it's two. Then it's turning, becoming negative, 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 and then it turns, becomes positive and more positive. So what I would like to do is I would like to graph the derivative based on looking at the function. So the left is the function, the right is the graph of the derivative. Now, a lot of students have trouble with this because if I just showed you the derivative graph and I asked you from negative two to negative one, is this function increasing or decreasing? Your mind plays tricks on you and you say it's decreasing because it's going down. No, 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 no. The graph of a derivative if you're above the x-axis, the derivative, the slope is positive, so it's increasing. If you're on the x-axis, that's where the derivative is zero. And if you're below the x-axis, that's where it's decreasing the entire time. What I find it easier to do is put these on top of each other. I find the zeros. What's a zero derivative? Where well, the slope goes flat, right? So that would be a flat slope and I go straight down and I put a point on the graph. There's another straight, flat zero, put a point on the graph. Then what I do is I say, okay, it's increasing, but it's starting to slow down, so all of this is above, it hit zero. All of this going down is this piece underneath here, because it's a negative slope, hit zero, and then it starts to go up. These take a little you know, time to get used to. Like if I asked you, is this the graph on the right of the derivative of this function? What I would do first, I would look to see how many zeros there are. One, two, three, where the graph goes flat. One, two, three. Increasing above, decreasing below, hits, hits that zero right there. All of this is increasing, which is all of this, hits zero, and then it starts to decrease. It takes a little practice getting these graphs of derivatives down. All right, now <clears throat> we already talked about, man, it would be cool if we could just have functions 
um, to be able to plug values in instead of having to work this limit definition all the time. And some of, some of you that have had calculus in high school, you already know uh, there, there are shortcuts, but I make you learn the limit definition first. So if I give you this function, it's a different function than the 16t squared, and I told you find the derivative at x equals 1, x equals 2, and x equals 3. Okay, if I just flat out said find the derivative for that, what would you do? I don't know. Sure you do. You would go get, so at 1, you would do your x plus h minus x over h. Why did I pick this for h? Because I wanted to, I just wanted a small value. Typically, students will pick 0 0.01 or 0 0.001. I just want a very small value so I can see the limiting value what this is going to. If I did it for 2, notice the only difference that's changing here is 2. If I did it for 3, and I could continue to do this, and it looks like the derivative is whatever this value is times 2. Notice 2x, two, 2 times 1, 2, 2 times 2, 4, 2 times 3, 6. So you're actually going to see there is a method to this madness that you will get into later that will show what is, is there a fast way to actually just look at a function, okay, with these different rules and get the actual derivative function. So stay tuned. I know you're excited. I am too.